This was a painting of a porn star named Ty Cash. I was, uh, you know, brought about in that idea of when you're um, painting people like Degas, sometimes you're objectifying them, right? Because Degas always paints people, women from the back in sort of torque positions. If you can imagine sort of Betty Page bondage or ropes around their arms and ankles, it doesn't seem so nice anymore. And I didn't really want to objectify anybody, but I felt that these, these people were already in magazines and so on. They have already been objectified, hopefully willingly so. And maybe my extra to them, uh, extra uh, uh, filters towards them wouldn't do any harm. Um, and this was a guy who was one of the first gay porn movies I'd ever seen uh, who seemed sort of starry-eyed and idealistic. And of course, with a lot of my work, um, they tend to be avatars for myself. I've never done porn, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, coming into the ideas of language, language such as uh, the word homosexuality, which as many of you guys know, wasn't uh, an idea even before the late 1800s when a Belgian uh, scientist came up with that term. And along with that term, homosexuality, came a lot of subjugation. This was my first show uh, at UCI. Luckily there, they gave us the gallery to exploit as much as we hopefully could. Um, and it was called Not. And the whole idea was, uh, at that time, and still, unfortunately, there are a lot of young people who commit suicide once they find out that there's, they are gay or lesbian, whatever these languages are, that are um, subjugating them. And they realize that they don't necessarily fit the, what those terms might mean to society. And there's this sort of uh, break, and maybe they break down, unfortunately, because of that. But also, I like the idea of maybe trying to capture the money shot moment of the orgasm. Uh, on film because it was when the body agreed with what was happening. It wasn't acting, it was actually doing something that was beyond performance, but like a, a record of something really happening that everybody knows is called like sort of the, the little death. And I thought that that would be interesting. Um, these were oil paintings on wax engraved, uh, uh, inscribed in them were sayings from plays that I've written in uh, the video, um, also says, so, so Ty Cash, it says, I can't believe it occurred to me, to me and me, to me, this is my life, this is my life, to me, to me. And uh, um, on the video was Der Fleeter Mouse playing over and over again. And uh, a person's voice saying, I can't believe you're doing this to yourself. I can't believe you're doing this yourself. So I'm working on different issues, thinking about Manet too, and you know, the death of Marat, and, and you know, fine art oil painting as I'm painting these guys. Uh, my second show there, the spring of my first year, um, was called Dirty Little Secrets. And this is the time post Dahmer. Um, uh, and it was interesting seeing pictures of Dahmer's living room because it seemed very domestic. He had pictures of like the Herberts guy holding tires. And it seemed so egregious that this guy who lived a normal life was murdering all these people and wondering what it was that was making that happen, but also thinking very much about like video and performance. I had a seven channel video along with an array of images. This is a close up of big drawing of a Hiromiya Bosch like scene with skeletons doing horrible things to people, but with a little humor added in. These are from old slides, sorry, but there's like Hello Kitty and there's a game room and, and stuff like that to sort of lighten it up. But of course this is a, still a time where a lot of people were still dying of AIDS related causes. And it was a way to deal with my fear of that by doing it. Um, these were images also from the same sort of porn film, but to mix it up and not have it merely be about desire coming in of age, I had text. I still really believe in ideas of word image combinations, and the text here is from the play Wojciech uh, that had a little mini, a mini narrative in it about a boy who goes to a moon and sees it as an upturned pot, and he's very sad, and it's very poetic. Um, this is Casper the Friendly Ghost, and a lot of people who are living with HIV at the time were referred to as ghosts or living ghosts. Um, and this is uh, a text from a Michelangelo uh, catalog and the chorus from a song from Annie Mame. Uh, this was a series of drawings I did for my uh, first show my second year. Um, that I put in old antique frames, which may or may not be a good thing. This is an old uh, grad school thing where people make great drawings and they find these old antique frames and then all anybody could talk about are the frames. So I don't know if I would do that again, but I really like sort of spinning off these ideas and sort of riffing on them. These were porn star heads. This is Keanu with the little prince and sort of a porn star and Saint Sebastian. 
Um, Keanu's been a big avatar for me. Uh, when I was at Brown, my friend Ginny Hoke had this idea of scoping people. And what a scope was, was somebody that you love, or you, at that time they printed people's schedules, and so you could scope somebody and go to their classes and stuff and like, you know, case them. Um, but it would be bad to meet your scope because you realize they never um, would be what you thought they would be. She loved Axl Rose. I mean, she's a super lefty liberal. I don't know what that was about, but she sent a giant Easter egg of, with her pictures of herself nude to Axl and never heard back. And so I chose Keanu as my scope um, back before my own private Idaho. Um, these were uh, part of a Pinocchio, the beginnings of a Pinocchio series that became my thesis show. Um, Again, semiox is the, the say of uh, symbols and signs as Mark described. And for me, that was really about ideas of language and also images and how they coincide and how they don't coincide. I don't know if you know this Assyrian sign, the concept of sign. For me, it's pinnacle to understanding all different kinds of art. What that is, you have that object that grows out of the ground like and you go Those are bad sound effects. Normally it would draw sort of something that looks like a broccoli but actually it would be a tree, the object that is tree, and then you draw a line under that and you write the word tree. The word is the signifier that addresses the signified. Um, and that in totality is called a sign or a Saussurian sign. To me, that's magic. You know, a lot of, uh, for me, what idea, I, to synthesize ideas of semiotics is, is that we understand things through language. Language is the software that operate, operates our hard drive as animals and we understand everything via language. If you read those Richard Scarry books when you're little and you see the fire hydrant next to Wormy and the cat and it says the words fire hydrant above it, we start understanding what that object is, as a fire hydrant. And sometimes that can supersede the way we interpret things. Um, I'm always interested in that play. You know, the neat thing about the Saussurian sign is that it's arbitrary that we would call that object that tree. Of course, it probably comes from Latin, the Tower of Babel or what have you. But in the end, when you start objectifying your world and seeing it anew and realizing that that language of words and the ideology that comes after those words helps to format how you think about things, you can really see things. Like a Buddhist would say you aren't sitting on a chair, you're sitting on a piece of plastic with wires and metal and screws, and if you stand on it, it's a ladder, right? To draw a chair really well, if you draw the negative space and if you abstract it in your mind, you'll draw better than if you think the word chair, which, which usually makes you like draw the symbol of the chair. And so for me, like this, this was an appropriate image of, uh, from the original Sikh Lodi text of Pinocchio, and the original image to me like, was the signifier of Pinocchio, but I wanted to get that ink blotch there that was sort of like the music that would amplify the feelings of Pinocchio. It's sort of like you know, blues music musicians will say, oh, my baby left me and I feel so bad, and then you hear the twing, twing, twum of their guitar. The lyrics inform what the song might be about, but then the guitar and music amplifies the feelings, the emotions that you feel. And how do you marry the two, or how do you separate the two? Um, this is something I was really interested in when I was doing these splotch drawings that led to my thesis show. As Mark aptly described, I was the campus cartoonist at Brown and was always the campus cartoonist since, I don't know, kindergarten. And I finally realized I should write a play, because I also did writing and directing of plays when I was at school, of uh, sort of a bad Cole Porter retelling of Pinocchio. But it would be told as if my version uh, occurred during the, all the other versions of Pinocchio. My version was called Pinocchio the Big Fag. Um, I thought this was a great story because Pinocchio needs to learn the language of the law of the society of his time in order to be a real boy. And so mine sort of follows that trajectory, but he sort of comes into his own knowing who he is as maybe a gay person or a gay puppet in order to find him himself. Um, I wrote the play, I started doing it as a comic, but I realized it was really hard to do all those panels. And I then decided, well, I should just like do illustrations for the book of Pinocchio as if uh, some gay collector collected all these different child, children's book illustrated plates of, of my version of the story. And I cast popular Hollywood characters as some of the figures to use the baggage of you know, uh, what they represent to, to give it some weight. So this is John Wayne as Geppetto. And it says uh, his name was Geppetto, but the boys in the neighborhood um, called him uh, the Italian word for cornmeal mush. 
Um, and I'll just take you through a few of these. There were about 55. Um, inter interspersed with it were sort of takeoffs on William Blake formatted images with my funny, hopefully, lyrics about how he, you know, uh, he had cut off his penis, but then made this puppet that with the blood of his penis comes to life. This is his first steps as a puppet. Uh, he eventually encounters in the field of wonders the fox and the cat who turn out to be cops, and then they hang him. Uh, luckily, uh, here it is uh, where they're hanging him, and then luckily Jodie Foster as the blue fairy who was currently going to Yale, uh, here she's reading Gender Trouble by Judith Butler, finds uh, Pinocchio hung in the tree and saves him. The caption here, as if it was a Rube Goldberg, New Yorker-esque kind of cartoon, says shut up and drink. And here, uh, the different names of theorists and people leading down to sort of the gender identity politics that I was like really consuming at the time. Uh, the senator began screaming off with his nose. And of course, this is Jesse Helms. And to date myself a little bit and have my hair fall out a little bit, that's Bill Clinton, who was, you know, did Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which we thought at the time might be like politically good, but of course that was sort of repressive. He knows who he is intellectually, but he kind of goes out into the world and is freaked out by like the sexuality that's going on. And this is really parallel to the original text, which is very visionary and filled with anthropomorphized serpents, not quite a serpent in my case. Um, he encounters Montgomery, Monty Pigeon, who lives in the cliff, a la Montgomery Cliff, who was like a repressed guy who drank too much, but a fantastic actor. Um, even though he sort of fanned out whom, who he is, the Blue Fairy rejects him because he hasn't really come into his own and come out in his own emotional life until he meets Lampwick, here played by Keanu Reeves. And this says, the Lampwick was the laziest boy in school, which is a direct quote from the play. Um, they have their fun and, and, and get to know each other. And then they go to the land of, uh, the land of boys where uh, wild things happen. Uh, but unfortunately, because of that, they turn into donkeys, obviously sort of a metaphor for HIV. Uh, but uh, here, uh, Pinocchio saving this guy from hegemony cricket, hegemony. Sorry, it's a, okay, everything has to be the same. Okay, no. Beware patriarchy, Pinocchio the big fag is here. Um, he can, confronts his dad in the whale, I'm here, I'm queer, I'm fabulous. Uh, and then they live happily ever after. Um, and this is the, the little boy found. Um, for he's Pinocchio, Pinocchio, Pinocchio the big fag, a guy um, who has sex with all types, all races or something. Uh, hey, he's okay. Believe me, it's kind of funny. I'm trying to get this in a book now. It's been 20 years since this, and maybe sometime you could read the script. But here you could see the sort of panoply of how it was arranged originally at UC Irvine, where people would really go through it and without reading a script, be hopefully able to tell what was going on. Um, your thesis show could be very important. Uh, good people saw my thesis show, and they brought it to San Francisco at this really neat gallery called Kiki, which was sort of a seminal gallery for a lot of great people in the Somar district. Uh, uh, Ann Philbin saw it there and brought it to the Drawing Center. It got me my openings page in Art Forum. It got me, helped get me a gallery in Los Angeles. And it was fine. Um, but I'm one of those artists when too many people get it, I sort of switch it up because I'm thinking it's too easy <laughs> for the better or the for worse. And so for my next show, I did seven different narratives mixed up in a whole kaleidoscope uh, cosmology. Uh, where the closure, Scott McCloud, if you've ever read the book Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, it's kind of my Bible, and it really talks about the power of icons and the power of juxtapositions to create content, where the closure is the active creation of the content by the part of the viewer or the reader. I really want to make that closure really transpire where people really had to think about how identity is formed based on these different ideas of different times and different styles. Um, this was uh, a, a series of River Phoenix, who's abducted by Blue Meanies and is saved uh, by a, sort of a teddy boy, John Lennon. River Phoenix had just died, and uh, you know I don't think he was gay or anything like that, but he was a starry-eyed, utopic idealist raised by hippie parents who really wanted to make the world a better place. Obviously, John Lennon was assassinated, and I don't think he was gay either, but it didn't matter to me. Um, I did it on metal. I made it look like sort of uh, the yellow submarine cartoon cells. This was next to uh, Keanu sightings. 
This was before he was super popular from Speed, and I would ask my friends if they saw Keanu, what was he wearing, what was he doing, like, what, what did you hear him say? Uh, this was uh, at the Chateau Marmont, and a friend of mine was at a party where he told an actor friend that he could sleep on his couch any time, whatever that would mean. And I tried to illustrate it like a, sort of like an old gay man sitting there plein air doing New Yorker type illustrations next to uh, charcoal renditions of Arthur Rimbaud, the poet, as a character, Maldoror, from the late 18th century visionary vampire novel written by the Comte de Lautremont, as uh, in the style of Odin Redon, another symbolist, signed by Verlaine, his older poet lover. Uh, next to pictures of uh, these pets that were collected by a guy who worked at a photo mat, and he would make extra copies of pets for himself before he died of HIV again, and I thought that those were sort of the perfect avatars to talk about maybe an anthropomorphized animal as, a, as maybe a ubiquitous person. It could be female, it could be male, gay or straight or whatever, but the feelings that could exude, like when you're looking at your puppy and you're like, oh, the puppy's really sad, even though it's just that you're that sad. Um, next two pictures of Archie from Archie, you know, Archie Andrews, who falls in love with Reggie, who's abducted by aliens, Reggie goes straight, and then Archie finds that he's an alien. I love um, Archie, which looks like Tintin, Tintin to me, the European comic by Hergé, which I think was influenced by Aroche, and um, early woodblock prints and screens and scrolls look to me like comics, so going back to that format to bring it back to the source, mixed in with a little Henry Darger, which I was looking at the time. I collected these images from a, a, a gay store down in Christopher Street that's not around anymore that used to sell old snapshots. And this was an old man that would, would masturbate and splice in pictures of himself masturbating with himself, which was weird. Um, next to these pictures based on a script that, um, from a, a, a porn tape where this really nice, smart guy uh, is interviewed before he has this horrible sex with some troll unprotected, and his uh, favorite star was Kurt Cameron, which I thought was ironic. Uh, and so just to take you through a little bit of this so you could sort of see what it was like here, uh, he's getting abducted by vampires. I wrote the script in French to make it a little bit more obscure so you could listen to it. Horrible things are happening with River and the Blue Meanies. Uh, here's another cat. Uh, this was Keanu sighted at Agnes B, um, another pet. Uh, this is where River and John fall into the sea of holes. I was making a lot of art jokes here. This is, looks like a Larry Poon's painting, and the hole is obviously something different with complementary towels for complementary colors. This was actually me um, playing soccer when I was a kid. I wasn't a very good player, but it reminded me of the guy who was interviewed. Um, here, they're passionately in love, appropriating ideas of Picasso's The Kiss, where I, horrible, the blue meanies, which to me probably were like an HIV virus, were, um, you know, murdering all of their friends. Here, uh, you know, there's like seven different narratives going on where, you know, Archie and Reggie are doing it, and Archie turns, or, or Reggie turns sort of into an alien, and, and uh, different things that really happened in my real life that I wouldn't want to go into detail unless it was a cartoon. Um, but they eventually find out that all you need is love, and, uh, and it was good, you know, it was, it was fun to, I sold these things as sets, or I wanted them to be seen together, because for me, most of my shows are like sort of like lockets, lost lockets, or pearls off a string, but here I really wanted to get the idea manifest that was about the juxtapositions that made the content. Um, but I love painting, and um, I realized that why am I this art director directing myself to do these things? The first John Richardson Picasso biography had just come out. And Picasso, if you want to paint a still life one day, you'd paint a still life. If you want to do a portrait another day, you'd do a portrait. You could do it in a you know, post-Cubist style, or you could do it in a classical style. Why was I art directing myself to do all these things in these postmodern languages? Why not just go to the source and enjoy painting? And maybe that could exude the feelings that I wanted to come out based on hopefully a good, meaningful, content-rich idea that I could think about while I'm, I'm executing it. So I did these pet paintings bigger. I was happy that this ended up in LACMA. Uh, this was a painting of my first Yorkie, uh, Gertrude, and my first cat named Wojciech. Never uh, name your uh, pets after tragic characters. It's not a good thing, but I won't go into it. This is a cat uh, pleading a chihuahua. 
my boyfriend, now I'm proud to say my husband, we've been together about 22 years, uh, gone to grad, grad center here, and I w took a big car trip. And on that car trip, I was listening a lot to the Beach Boys, and this really had a big effect on me, like the really good Beach Boys when Brian Wilson still had his wherewithal. But if you listen to Pet Sounds, he's able to really marry language with music so well. I don't know if you know that song, Caroline No, but it, it says like, a baby cry. Sorry, I'm not a singer. But the cron that, that word turns into music. And he's able to marry the signifier with the signified to come up with something that was uber that. And I also want to get to the batteries that were sort of operating my stylistic engines. I felt I could appropriate a lot of different styles for those language that, that could transpire. But what, it, what was the real me about? You know, Picasso would say, Picasso says, if you draw a circle without an aid of a compass, it's imperfection is your style. Or if you copy the old masters, how it's not like the old masters is your style. And so I started doing a lot of automatic drawing, a lot of automatic painting when I first arrived in New York, and then making paintings from it, not caring you know, if people would like them, not caring if people got it, but just wanting to get to the source. Um, and so this, I felt, was like a giant battery. It was one of these first sort of iconscapes, I call them. This was the word police turn on on its head to become sort of this you know, giant RoboCop guy, a small painting, though. Um, this was a circle painting. Supposedly crazy people did circles a lot. I wanted to know what that was about. But I want these things to have sort of this energy where you look at them and they pulsate. I really do think that any kind of great art, even if it's super smart, has a life of its own. And hopefully if it's really formal, it actually moves. It vacillates as you look at it. Um, I did a show derived from a lot of these drawings in Los Angeles called Monty's Dream, The Sleeper in the Valley, uh, based on you know, these ideas and, and as if Montgomery Cliff had a dream and the sleeper in the valley is the Rambeau poem where everything's alive except you find out at the end there's soldiers in the field who's dead, who it's ultimately about. The first of these paintings, and these were five by seven feet, so they're really big, came from a lot of automatic drawing. Um, it looks like that game Simon that people of my generation may have played when they were young and sort of an R2-D2 character coming out of like the sort of head of the snake kind of thing. But I felt that this was sort of like primal early age and then next to it, kind of like a movie with each one the same format, like a movie screen, was early adolescence. This is a FU flag, and this is happy face who's not happy at all. It says, hey gang, um, I'm happy face, the have a nice day dude. Everything, you know, S-U-C-K-S, -S, go to effing hell. And this is like, I got bored painting this, so I stopped right here. And I'm really trying to trip up myself and loosen up and try to, you know, come to something new derived from figurative narrative allegory. This was sort of uh, adolescence. This is sort of adulthood, and I, I find a lot of my work, even though I'm not religious, I feel I'm very spiritual, tends to be kind of apocalyptic or last judgment-y. These were skeletons getting all the sheep off the earth. Um, and then here are the aliens taking care of the people who are left. Kind of looks like a giant face, too, to me, like eyes, nose, and mouth. And this was the end where, you know, the people who survive, like, are leaving in a spaceship with the Death Star looking sad. Um, you know, Star Wars was really influenced by minimalism, and I want to bring it back to sort of the minimalist source. Um, uh, I started doing these things. Not everybody understood them, but luckily I was able to get in some shows at good places, and I was doing these circle paintings a lot and really enjoying them, but ultimately they started feeling like production. But I really wanted these things to vastly, but I started getting known here a little bit by doing these abstract paintings. But my first breakout show was here at Jay Gorney uh, when it was a good gallery on Green Street. And I lucked out to have this show and I decided to do abstract paintings or figurative abstractions. I call them iconscapes. Uh, Scott McCloud talks about the power of the icon, which is like the, ha the have a nice day do the happy face. And the power of that is if something's really essentialized and simple, everybody can relate to it. And I still think of these as figurative paintings, but I want them to make them relatable by making them really simple, and this is sort of like a razor-like figure who looks a little sad. And I juxtaposed it to um, this painting. This is of Jesus Christ Superstar. I'm always spiritually seeking, and a lot of my ideas of religion come from you know, that musical, at least Catholicism. Um, I was painting this in the basement on Christopher Street, and the electricians came by, and the painting knocked over on my palette. And I was like, Eureka, it's finished, because it looked like he got <laughs> was stone. Um, this was next to this painting where I really wanted this sort of thing to feel like it was sort of emanating out. Next to this painting of, uh, this is uh, Laurence Olivier as Hamlet. 
uh, next to this painting. And I really, you know, talking about the power of the icon, I want this to be like sort of a face inside a face. We're always looking at faces as good compositions. And I want, as the viewer looks at this, for this thing to vacillate. Um, next to this painting, which I felt was sort of like this weird egg that you could reach in and grab. Next to this is uh, Olivier as Henry V. Next to this was, was also from Jesus Christ Superstar, but with a lot of mo automatic painting and stuff. And I realized later it looks like this sort of, you know, rabbit-like character is holding something that looked like a bird, which I was, you know, looking later at Raphael and Madonna the Goldfinch and realized that's symbolic for his passion. And, um, next to this, which was one of the first big circle paintings I did where I really wanted this to be sort of hovering in a middle space. Uh, next to this, a Frankenstein where I want to do a non-cheesy painting of Frankenstein as an abject character. Next to this, which was Keanu from Point Break. And, you know, they're placed as if, like, he's, like, shooting the Frankenstein, maybe, if you're generous in your interpretation. Next to this, which was an automatic painting, but I found that there were so many um, figures that were derived from my unconscious. I'm a son of a psychoanalyst, and so I have a real penchant for the unconscious. I think Marx and Duchamp took us off a necessary track away from Freud and surrealism and abstraction, and we understand all the politics that come from that, but now I like to think that we have, we've come full circle and there's room to explore abstraction, there's room to explore the unconscious again, that we haven't really figured out everything about dreams. And if art is about transcendence and about freedom, maybe in your dreams, in that meditation, the things that you quite can't understand, the stuff that comes from the flick of your brush when you're working consciously at something, but the stuff that you can't control is the thing that gives it life. And what could that be about? And can you make an abstract, pain, abstract painting that's always a little figurative I think there's no true thing as abstraction, but try to, you know, make a dream come alive and palatable. Um, this was a porn star named Johan Pollock, who was kind of cool at the time, but I just want to go uh, full into it. Um, next to this, uh, Castles in the Sky and uh, Boats at Sea. This is also from Henry V. Next to this, which was a picture of uh, Montgomery Cliff from Red River, and I feel it sort of turned into a weird horse. Big moment for me was seeing the movie Rembrandt, uh, starring Charles Lawton as Rembrandt from the 30s. Have you guys ever seen that? Um, after Rembrandt exiles himself to Rembrandt land for painting things too real or doing the night watch for, you know, which the Schweiners of the time didn't really like because he made it weird and dark and strange. Um, there's this great scene in this movie where there's this homeless guy dressed as King Solomon and uh, that he's painting. And the homeless guy says, why are you painting me? I'm just a homeless guy. I'm paraphrasing, of course. And Rembrandt says, no, 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 no. Your dress is King Saul. It means this and this and this to me. And he goes in this whole teary-eyed soliloquy of the vanity of vanities, everything is vanity, et cetera. At the end of it, the homeless guy's crying. Tobias with a lute has a tear in his eye. And you know, Rembrandt's kind of going like this. And I realized that you know, painting portraiture is in painting, and what Rembrandt was doing was really like method acting. Do you guys know what method acting is? Um, James Dean kind of comes from that school, is influenced by that school, but it's when you insert part of your real life into a character and really know everything about that character, but are able to infuse what's important to you into your role. And so uh, in Rebel Without a Cause, when James Dean's having a fight with Jim Backus, who played his dad, the voice of Mr. Magoo, um, the, supposedly they made the set look like James Dean's real childhood home, and they had the same brick fireplace as his real brick fireplace. And so when he comes on set, he sort of looks at that brick fireplace and it becomes sort of a talisman to those real feelings, those real emotions that he felt. So when he's singing those lines as an actor, those real emotions come about. And I realize that maybe Rembrandt's doing the same thing. He's setting up allegories that mean something to him and why he's negotiating those abstract notions of positive and negative space and color and form and light, et cetera. Those, the weird stuff slips into that of the emotions that he's feeling towards the things that he's meditating upon as he's painting. You know, when you look at Rembrandt at the Met, you might not know who all those people are, but if you like Rembrandt, you feel the emotion, and that's something that we celebrate. And I don't think emotion's a bad thing. I think you can make paintings that are beautiful, that are emotional, that are also smart, too. Um, there were drawings in the show, um, which I w had been most, mostly known for. This is, this is called, this is a drawing about dying. It's Montgomery Cliff. Weirdly, subconsciously, it looks like, you know, like death with a guillotine. Um, this was Mike Myers you know, from Halloween, the sort of series of this boy. Um, I really like that sort of fiery landscape, and I want to explore that even more. And luckily, I got a show at uh, Mary Boone uh, of these paintings uh, curated by this guy, Klaus Curtis. 
And I was thinking of them as sort of the four horsemen. And while I was painting this, I was trying to, you know, listen to like Joy Division and like really dark music because I always think you need to really listen to stuff to kind of get you in the mood and create an, you know, uh, an environment that helps to get you there emotionally. Uh, this was more of a heavenly one. I was listening to the folkways recordings of the anthology of folk, uh, of folk music and all the religious tracks that they had on there. Next to a darker one, next to a hypothetically happier one. People didn't get the Jay Gorney show. They didn't really get this, which is funny to me because like Soutine was uptown at the Jewish Museum. There's a lot of stuff uptown that was about abstract expressionism and like painting really thickly. Um, but the style of the time, the, the movement of the time, if you could call it that, was art and fashion. And so I was always, always suspect about that. I always felt like if a wealthy person could buy a fur, they could also buy a painting. And when the fur went out of the style, they put it in the back of the closet like they would the painting. The paintings that were around were very photorealistic. Um, they were like really like dead on and tight. Um, and you know, John Kerr and Lisa Escavich were coming around, but those, that was so much about style. Um, painters really got this show, which I was super, super happy about in this work. Other artists, some collectors got it. Um, a lot of people didn't. But I always think a really good show should be like a bomb, but in a good way, right? If you're creating binaries, a lot of people love it and a lot of people hate it. Maybe you're doing something that's a little different. I think it's always good to take that risk. Um, however, uh, uh, and this ended up, you know, this Matthew Marks, Pat Hearn show. Uh, we moved uptown uh, to Midtown in this neat space on 46th Street that was 1,300 square feet for $1,300 a month, which seemed awesome, but this place was definitely haunted. It was weird. We were moving stuff the first day for the floor people, and something fell on our poodle puppy and killed her our first day in. And then we came back from the hospital with blood, you know, on us. And these guys, you know, who are the floor below, who are mobsters, but like evil mobsters, not like on TV, came in there like, come on in and, you know, what kind of wallpaper you like? You like this wallpaper, this wallpaper. And they were definitely, you know, starting a bordello there because there was sort of this red velveteen wallpaper. And so the bordello happened and these haggard, you know, I'm pro-sex worker, et cetera, but these haggard looking women came in there and they played demonic disco music all night and it was depressing and weird. <laughs> I was also having this sort of, you know, I was still woefully naive in my late 20s, early 30s, and I was like, oh, the mendacity of the art world. Luckily, I had some success, but I was like, oh, rich white people, who cares about them? Is this the audience I really wanted to talk about? Like, what is this BS? And, you know, I had this sort of idealistic Holden Caulfield Rambo moment. And um, Andrew uh, got really depressed for the puppy and everything. And, he was like, I want out, let's just leave. And we had an opportunity to buy um, his grandfather's cabin from his mom, and I pulled all my work out from the galleries, took myself completely off the map, and moved to uh, Lake Elsinore, California, in the middle of nowhere next to trailer homes with crystal meth labs and retirees, and I thought that was it, I was gonna retire and paint plein air, like Cezanne and Van Gogh, my heroes. Um, I, I luckily got to teach at UC Irvine, but I realized after a year of this, if those people at Walmart really knew what we were about, they'd probably club us. And um, it seems very romantic. I still love it. I'd love to be able to move there and grow up my beard really long and be like Monet and have it be my blighted Givonier. Uh, but this was a tough year of sort of self-discovery, but these paintings came from it. And luckily my friend, after the mobsters got closed down by the police, even though the police participated in it, um, my friend opened up a little space there and I got to show these. This is White Check and the Moon. I just did this planner in California thinking the content was two gay men, you know, uh, domesticate and have this little home out in the middle of nowhere and live our bohemian artistic life together. Maybe that's enough content. It was performative. We were doing what a lot of the stories that I was doing before was about. This was one of the abstract paintings that came from that period, you know, just riffing off the landscape, loving Cezanne. This, the, we raised 20 chickens and ducks, and we had two German shepherds, and so this was sort of me riffing off the ducks and the German shepherds, and when the moment left me, I was like, oh, it's done. You know, if I put in something, I don't know if you guys sometimes do paintings like this, and you fill in one part that you feel that feels unfinished, and then it collapses like a souffle taken out of the oven too soon, and you're like, oh, why did I do that? So I just sort of left it uh, really raw. Um, anyway, 
I came back to New York with my tail between my legs and, you know, FYI, just never pull yourself off the map. If you're lucky enough to get on the map or fortunate enough to get on the map of the New York City art world, it's bad to take yourself off it because people don't feel like you respected all the opportunity that you had. And I was stupid, you know. It took me seven years living on Prince Street in a little tiny apartment, just painting and painting away. I had written sort of a bad uh, sci-fi homoerotic screenplay called Hamlet 1999. I spent seven years filling my apartment with all these paintings sort of riffing off that script. Uh, this is Arthur Rambeau next to a sort of an abstract uh, a painting. This was Michelangelo's Pieta. And uh, all these people were sort of avatars for Hamlet for me. And everybody, I'm assuming, knows Hamlet's story. Uh, this is Mercutio, Hamlet's friend, played by River Phoenix. But these were malleable, mutable characters that changed, um, that were sort of coming off the temper and the emotion of it. I also found when I was in New York City living in a little apartment, it was easier to look at photos again rather than look outside. This is from an old uh, science fiction horror movie called The Twins, where he's looking at a fetus in a jar. Um, this, of course, is Miyazaki's, uh, print, you know, Ashitaka from Princess Mononoke, who feels very Hamlet to me because he's sort of disillusioned with the world and needs to try to save it. Um, I had a, a project room show at Derek Eller when he was on 25th Street, and luckily it did well enough. Uh, it got, you know, some good reviews and people bought a few things and RSEMA like it that he gave me the big space as sort of a comeback show, even though I'd shown here and there in museums and stuff. Um, but basically, I transported my whole tiny apartment to the gallery, and I hung salon style all these paintings. Um, you're never supposed to give more supply than there is demand. Um, there weren't like collectors knocking on my door or anything, but I was like, F it. You know, I tried different installations, but I realized I had to do the whole enchilada. Uh, and luckily, people liked this show, and it did well, and you know, I haven't looked back since. This was in 2004, and I even hung things that they hung over the doorway. Um, so I'll take you few, through a few of these. Um, this was James Dean as Hamlet. I had this moment watching Constantine. I had to leave the theater because I realized that maybe Keanu really was a bad actor. <laughs> Which I still don't wholeheartedly believe, but I was like, you know, maybe I should paint people that, that really affected culture in a big way. You know, James Dean was gay. People don't maybe know this, but he died when he was 24, only made three movies. But he was one of the first people to give a voice to the youth generation. He inspired Elvis B. Elvis and John Lennon B. John Lennon. I'd like to think that rock and roll wouldn't have happened with James Dean, nor would Woodstock. He's sort of the beginning of that, sort of a gay hero of mine, which is a perfect Hamlet. This was Claudius. Oh, this whole series, by the way, started the first day Bush was inaugurated in an office. And so he was a perfect Claudius and an impetus to do this work as a super lefty liberal. So this is Claudius as Yul Brynner in Westworld robot with his face off. You know, this is the ghost played by Superman. It kind of looks like John Kerry to me. I painted this during that campaign. Unconsciously came out. Rambo again as Hamlet. Spider-Man as Hamlet. You know, Doc Ock as Claudius. I really want these things to kind of break in a, you know, I really think the power of Cezanne is he's just looking in the mountain. His unconscious projecting onto that landscape and all these things occur in terms of form and light and color, but his unconscious projects into this. And I was really interested in these, how they broke down into sort of an unconscious abstraction or figurative abstraction. This is from a science fiction book about uh, the movie Buddy. And, you know, I, I feel like a postmodern, uh, idea for me is a lot of postmodernity is that it's about agency being reified in capital, like agency, who we are as individuals and spirits and, and free thinking people being reified, which means sort of flattened out like flour in a pizza dough into the capitalist machine. Um, and I felt, you know, gorillas or, you know, King Kong could be an allegory for that. And certainly sometimes I feel a little bit like a manipulated gorilla, but I was really interested also what was happening in the skull and so on. This was Spider-Man trying to save the day. And I hung this, and I pa started painting these around 9-11. Actually, this is the only way I could deal with 9-11 on the anniversary of 9-11 to talk about it. Uh, but this is Jimmy Stewart from Vertigo. And then below that was uh, an image from the remake of King Kong from the 70s. And really, I was using this as an allegorical avatar to get over all my feelings of 9-11 having witnessed it. Um, this was the ghost played by John Lennon. River Phoenix again as, uh, I'm sorry, Horatio, uh, James Dean as Hamlet, Keanu as Hamlet from The Matrix. Uh, this is Lincoln's cabin, you know, really, 
pining away my pandas for Andrew who is still in California and thinking that Lincoln was a good Republican wanting to do good things from a more innocent time. Harry Potter as a young Hamlet. This was uh, from the Phantom of the Opera, the color sequence that gave me nightmares when I was a child. And I felt this was really like Claudius. Uh, this is him trying to escape from, Lake El from Elsinore. Uh, this is the, uh, the Virgin, this is Mary from Houston Street. I was living between, around Prince and Houston. For my own photo, this is uh, Olivia's Hamlet again. This is the Beatles next to, this is sort of like my Rothko, is like the Beatles next to an abstract painting or figurative ab ab iconscape. And I was thinking like, you know, like when people would go to the, the gas chambers in Auschwitz, there was always this band that was playing to try to make them feel better sort of towards the end of that play. This is Jesus as the ghost from the, uh, an image from the original Michelangelo wooden statue. Towards the end, uh, this is Superman, and I like this because it was act on comics, and a lot of these ideas really come from comics in terms of the iconic characters in juxtapos juxtaposed sequence. Um, Washington from uh, Gilbert Stewart, but I felt like if, uh, if, uh, the real George knew what GW was up to. He'd never stop crying. Um, and this was the end, that's all folks, which could be like the end of the world, but of course the Warner Brothers cartoon. So luckily the show did okay, and I was starting to get more shows. This is a big Elvis. I was starting to really get an Elvis. You know, Elvis appropriated all of his songs. He never wrote any of his own music, but he was able to infuse in the lyrics of these appropriate, sometimes cheesy songs, real emotions and feelings that he was feeling, which is one of the reasons he was so good. I mean, John Lennon was amazing, and, and the Beatles for writing their own music, but he's actually feeling it. This is a show I got in Los Angeles, um, and it was called, uh, uh, rebel angels at the end of the world because I realized in painting these they were really all like sort of rebel angels. James Dean, uh, Montgomery Cliff again hopefully spilling into sort of uh, uh, unconscious abstraction from from here to eternity where he really doesn't want to go to war. I was listening a lot to Marvin Gaye and I think he was so good like the Beach Boys but even more so for inserting politics and sort of his lyricism and his musicality. Um, uh, James Dean was started more and more looking like Bush to me, and that was his character from Giant, who was a bad character. Um, in Lake Elsinore, I found this folder filled with images of the guy who was a costume character actor who died, and somehow this thrift store got these pictures. But he was not the famous dancing bear, but a bear on the Captain Kangaroo show. And so I did this painting, and I felt this was sort of like, you know, going into heaven, you know, and being at the gate, and hopefully not serving mammon, but something else. Uh, we love collecting these trains, Markland trains, but I felt that this was sort of about the Industrial Revolution. You know, uh, this is from the costume character guy. This is Alien, uh, the Alien and Andy Williams. This is George cutting John's hair. Uh, you know, I was really into Picasso and the sort of the classicism of Picasso. I felt like it was sort of going to this other space. Also, weirdly, uncannily, in a lot of photos of the Beatles, uh, the dead Beatles, uh, you know, uh, George and John are always together, and the live ones are always together. It's weird. But I love John Lennon, and I love George Harrison for bringing populist music to the masses that was about something, and mostly about love, right? Uh, this was um, uh, outside the White House, and I wanted that to be sort of allegorical uh, from the beginning of Rebel Without a Cause. Um, this I painted, you know, when we first started going to war, and I was, you know, in James Dean character in his giant, he discovers oil, and he's sort of this egregious character. But it was my love for oil paint, but also worry that we're getting into Iraq and stuff for, for, for oil, right? Um, this was next to the James Dean crash site. I found like when you start using images of historical scenes that really happened, there's a lot of intensity to it. Like I, I don't necessarily believe in ghosts or fourth dimensions or anything like that, but I found like riffing off these things, these sort of historical moments, if this is historical, I started seeing like sort of an angel and this might have been James Dean. All this weird stuff started happening from these real photos instead of merely movie stills. But uh, this was with, um, I was listening a lot to, um, to, uh, to liberal radio, pol political radio, and this was when the mother was camped outside of the bushes and to uh, oppose the war because her son had died. And this was right when Katrina happened. You know, I, I grew up with this image in my bedroom, always wanted to paint it, but for me, I was listening to Air America, all about Katrina and thinking about the horrors that happened and our, our non-response for it. 
Uh, I had a show called Heroes in Brussels. I feel like this was sort of a simple allegory that I could think of like what heroes could be. You know, Judy Garland, I, I started doing a lot of paintings because a lot of older gay men love her. A lot of younger gay men are terrified of her. I want to find out what that was about. But like any journalist who starts investigating a cult, you become a member. Um, but you know, Judy had many, many comebacks. Even when she was really young, she never really went away. And she was a super empowered woman who was a strong female protagonist, despite you know, what happened outside the set or in her songs, that would, like Elvis, was able to bring real feelings to her music that was transportative. Of course, there are a lot of Torch songs, but James Dean was inspired by her. She's Bob Dylan's uh, favorite singer. Uh, this is Elvis. John Lennon, one of his last performances for Imagine. Uh, this is the Bed In For Peace, which I think is one of the greatest pieces of performance art because everybody knows about it and it created a song that they still sing. There's Timothy Leary in the front and one of the Smothers Brothers playing guitar. Uh, you know, I love Warhol, uh, but I feel like my theory about Warhol is he probably has Asperger's or he had Asperger's. I've had, I've had Asperger's students and they could be really geniuses and great, but touchy-feely emotions, not their forte, right? And I think that you know, if you could marry the iconic symbiology that Warhol had and the resonance from that with the emotions and feeling in the painterly from Rembrandt, you could have something, right? Why do we have to shoe the painterly for the iconic? Why do we have to give up the brush? Uh, and so I wanted to do an image that was very popular for, uh, for Warhol to do, but also try to bring new life to it by thinking about what it meant to me why I did it and have, have, hopefully have all those things come out. You know, I love JFK as a hero, even though he has the sort, you know, part of his history sort of murky. Uh, and this is Laurence Olivier, who also was a gay uh, person and one of the greatest actors of all time that influences generations. Jimi Hendrix goes without saying, one of the best musicians of all time, it would, bringing us into transcendent other worlds. Tintin, because I love Tintin, and it was a Belgian cartoon, and it seemed to make sense, but also reinterpreting some of these cartoons I grew up with. You know, you don't normally think of Bugs Bunny as a gay character, but he's pretty swish. <laughs> <laughs> Errol Flynn, uh, who was also bisexual, as Robin Hood, who was a character I really admired for being a character. Uh, this show is called uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, like having, a, I'm having like a, a, a moment. Um, kings and queens. And I was really thinking this is sort of being a last judgment like painting, like if all these people went to heaven, who would be surrounding Jesus like in the last judgment? This is Proust, you know, who talked about the idea of the sublime where you become conscious of your consciousness and he talked about in remembrance of things past his critics seeing a work by Vermeer and having it send him in the sort of sublime other world. And this is a picture of Proust right after he saw that same Vermeer that he wrote about later. Um, of course, this is from The Last Judgment by Michelangelo. Um, I love this movie, My Own Private Idaho. I still think it feels like about, it's about freedom. Um, Jupiter, the king of planets, which is a gaseous planet, obviously, and I'm worried of, you know, if we're too addicted to oil, hopefully this won't be what Earth looks like in the future. This is from Rebel Without a Cause. I teach a class on anime at SVA, and I love the idea of mecha, you know, the giant robot machines. And I felt like, you know, this is the observatory, of course, but it almost looked like a giant machine at the end of the world. And this is the scene in Rebel where he turns around and he says, um, you know, don't worry, it's okay. It'll be okay to Salminio, who's scared by the observatory and, and you know, the, the disaster that the observatory, the technician talks about in that movie. This is Elvis in one of his first performances. I know there's a lot of politics about Elvis. I totally appreciate that. But at the same time, when he's making this music, it freaked people out. People didn't know what was happening. They'd never seen anything like that before. And this is, you know, an actual image from that scene from one of his first concerts. This is, the, the, this is Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And this is before Obama, but in, in a weird way, this, this feels a little bit Obama-esque to me. You know, if you've ever seen this movie or any Frank Capra film, it's always about an underling sort of taking on the system and winning. This is real life, of course. This is Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. And I love her and him. And um, of course, this is Eleanor Roosevelt and JFK. She was against the Kennedys, but then after his rivals kind of went away, he went to her. And she was a very prominent public figure. She wrote, um, she wrote uh, articles. She had a radio show. A lot of people listened to her. She was a super empowered woman. 
and he needed her approval uh, to win the presidency. So they, I guess he got it in the scene. There's a Matisse painting in the background, which I like. This is the Beatles' last public, um, you know, all these people were getting assassinated, and so they were really scared, but they allow themselves to be in sort of a parade, a confetti parade for them in San Francisco. And I think, you know, the world changed because of the Beatles. Like, they were able to really bring that populist voice, but it really is mostly about love. You know, I think if love's in the wind in your sails, or if you're trying to make the world a better place through your work, maybe something good happens because of that. And, uh, you know, they're the Michelangelo's of pop music. You, I don't think, I never get tired of them. Um, Wizard of Oz, you know, this is a magic movie that should have never happened. It had three different directors. All kinds of things happened with the Munchkins. It was a weird scene. And yet this is an iconographic movie that changed culture. I mean, this is a film that changed culture. It was popular in its time, but when the boomer generation came around, it was on TV every year and people started watching it. If you're a Miyazaki fan, you know about shoujo, strong female protagonist, right? That this was a early shoujo-esque kind of movie where it's a strong female protagonist that helps these hapless kind of gay guys, you know, get what they want and not just about capitalism, but just coming into her own as a person. Uh, this is James Dean in a tree. This is from a notorious uh, photo that's supposedly of him that could have been him because he was a pretty free spirit. Um, and then this is from one of the first science fiction films, fantasy films, uh, from the, one of those old uh, Thomas Edison silent movies of uh, the eagle's uh, baby getting abducted from an eagle's, eagle's nest, but I thought it was sort of my um, Ganymede painting. You know, I don't know if you know that Rembrandt one, but Ganymede's like hoisted to Mount Olympus to be the water bearer for the gods. But I want to get more real. Like I find I was speaking through a lot of allegory. I went to, when I went to Amsterdam, I loved the Anne Frank house. When I was first there after college, it really stirred me. I mean, it seems weird to talk about like an art piece, but like Robert Gober has never done anything as moving as the Anne Frank house. So it feels haunted in a good way to remind us, you know, all of what she had gone through. It was so loaded. And of course I was moved to tears. And uh, when I went back, I realized that she made a wall for herself of different images that might have influenced me of, you know, popular actors and, and singers in her time, along with, you know, quotes from Da Vinci and Michelangelo, and she really looked at these images as she was hiding out for hope, in the same way that I look at art for hope. Um, this was called Friends and Family, and this was in Ohio, and we lost, you know, the second election to Bush because of Ohio, and so I want to do my small part to hopefully influence them in a good way and also go back to the source of really heroicizing people that existed. This is Matthew Shepard, the guy who got um, beat up and like crucified in Wyoming for being gay. Okay, this is 9-11, uh, so it's you know the anniversary of 9-11 today. Um, when it happened in Soho, we heard the planes fly overhead and uh, it immediately went on the news and I was going to teach at NYU that morning. I walked out and I saw the people's mouths agape looking like a Steven Spielberg movie at the hole with all the little people in it. I went to my drawing class and I teach composition via the, the gag cartoon. I was like, look guys, you know, I can't talk about cartoons obviously, but everybody's in a state of shock. We didn't know what to do. So we went to Washington Square just in time for the first tower to fall. And you know, everybody in the park was screaming and crying. My kids were really great and they were hugging them and saying that it was okay. And of course, as a class dismissed, go home, call your parents, tell them it's okay. But I had nightmares about it, right? And my dad was in town and he saved these newspapers. And he was like, Keith, you gotta paint these pictures from the newspaper. I was like, no, I'm not gonna exploit this horrible, you know, tragically sublime kind of thing, like by painting it. But after having these nightmares and being a John Lennon fan of seeing the people fall, I, I, in my nightmares I would say, all you need is love, you know, as they're falling. I felt like, you know, sometimes not all art is therapy, but everybody's working out something when they're doing something. And if I could make images from this, maybe I could own my nightmare. And if I could own my nightmare, and as a son of a psychoanalyst, maybe I could overcome it, which is kind of true. You know, I painted these, I didn't have the nightmares anymore. I thought New Yorkers would freak out, but nobody in Cleveland threw any tomatoes at me, so maybe it was okay. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm really proud to say that the Whitney got this. I didn't want it for sale. I didn't want it in public hands. I didn't want to end up in some weird country or anywhere. I wanted it to be in places that were affected by it. Uh, Anne Frank, would, uh, this ended up in the Cleveland Museum, I'm proud to say, Elvis. Uh, Muhammad Ali, people don't really think of Muhammad Ali's name, but you know, he's. He, he turned to Islam, right? And he was against the Vietnam War, and he was boycotted, uh, but he came back. 
Katharine Hepburn might have been a lesbian, wore pantsuits for women way before that was popular, but really popularized the independent spirit of a strong woman. The Earth, which I'm hopefully friends with. That's for the first photo from, taken by a human from Earth from the Gore speech. Uh, Jackie. Uh, and Martin Luther King. I painted this originally right time, around the time of Katrina for the Miami Art Fair. Because <laughs> I felt like, you know, if, if he knew what was happening, you know, with Katrina, he would never stop crying. Of course, it didn't sell, but I think with an art fair, which is so much of a cash and carry kind of world, it's good to try to make a statement, right? And make something that people wouldn't forget. Um, this is called Neo Integrity. I'm proud that Mark was part of this show. Um, I had an idea when I was young to start an art movement. I see my first Mike Kelly show, the ones with the stuffed animals on blankets. I was like, oh my gosh, this is new. Um, it has like postmodernism -mo post in it because it's like obviously Duchamp, you know, it's like a shitty thing on a blanket in a gallery for a lot of money and makes you think about art. But there was something really personal and narrative and formal about it too. Like he kind of had his cake and ate it too. I think, and that begat an idea of, of, for me of a post postmodernity, what I called neo-integrity that was about the integrity of the form and doing things with great intentions, with a lot of passion, that it could also be about transcendence and beauty too. Because um, I think you could, you know, I think good work should always be about something and should be super content rich. But if you don't have that form to seduce your viewer into looking at it, they aren't going to think about what it, hopefully it means. That, and hopefully what it means isn't limited to a didactic statement. And so this had famous people in it. Uh, this is Dana Schutz, and, uh, and around here is like Mike Kelly and John Miller and Katia Santabez. And, 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 but I realized that it, this was sort of slightly before Facebook really hit. It was about sort of families, artistic families and discourses. You know, you guys are the, of the SVA school, and so you have your own discourse happening. But I find when you go to galleries and openings and stuff, you find yourself congregated with like-minded fellow travelers, and those become your artistic families. And so as one merged into another, there was a lot of different kinds of work in this show. And of course, there's a panoply of a, a wild amount of work in this show. But at the same time, I felt like where everybody met was that they were doing something formal that was super content rich that allowed ideas for a different interpretation of beauty and, and stuff to, to transpire. And so this was really fun. And for me, it was all about the opening. you know. And I got a really good band to play that was also part of the show. And, and a lot of people came because I really wanted that sort of cedar tavern, but in a good way thing where people were really talking, which really happened. It was the, the aluminum group played in, a, in the office. And this, to call out Mark, this is from a poster from a project that he had done. And I was really happy with this show, and people seemed to like it and kind of got it. And there were also in this show cartoonists and illustrators as well as fine artists. This is a colleague of mine, Marvin Maddelson, who also teaches at SVA, but he's a famous portrait artist who teaches in illustration and can teach you how to paint just like that. But that's a picture of his son. You know, and he's not really involved with the Chelsea Gallery world at all, but I think these hierarchies are stupid. You know, and like, why not have everything elevated? You know, um, so uh, another Martin Luther King for another fair. I want to really start paying pictures from my own life more and more. I, I, I looked around my images and I realized that I wasn't the originator of a lot of the source material. And like, I wanted the autonomy of having the source and, and I wanted to paint things that were truly direct and meaningful to my life. And so this is a tree in California of a place that we wish that we could live in. Um, and also to sort of jettison this, for a weird reason, I was hired by Interview Magazine to cover the Haute Couture shows in Paris. I don't know why, but it ended up being in Ingrid Sishi's last issue, and I got to fly there with Andrew and go backstage and take all kinds of images. They really wanted me to be a sketch artist, but I realized to do it really well, I had to just take photos. I sketched so I would have a metonymic memory of what it was like. Um, but that was uh, Versace. This was backstage at Dior. Um, this was the Armani uh, show with Sophia Loren. And I was really interested in the audience. I felt it was like a Goya painting. They looked like they wanted to eat these people. And it was also at the time that, you know, the economy was starting to really rock and shake. And I'm like living off my credit card in this place of incredible splendor. And it was really this weird push and pull of like, oh my gosh, what a fantastical world. Um, you know, I had a renewed appreciation for these people because like somebody like him, Karl Lagerfeld, really does his research. And, you know, he really does things with 
great sincerity and these guys are making shows like artists like twice a year where they're just pushing out stuff but it has to be new and fresh and interesting and like you've seen Laurent Chanel really change culture too and so at their very best they're doing something different. Um, this was the last uh, Valentino show that he did right before he retired. So I really wanted to get the feeling of like this weird fanciful spaceship of the sensation of this strange place but like Goya maybe hopefully critically comment on it while I was doing it. Um, this was Good Leaders, Endangered Species, Ships at Sea, part one at Kim Light Gallery. Um, and this was right when the campaigns were really beginning uh, and the debates between Hillary and Obama were happening. Um, this is called Drum, drum, drum Majors, uh, you know, based on that Martin Luther King quote. And I was painting this and I, I realized that this sort of looks like a young kid version of Obama kind of unconsciously came out. Um, you know, and she, you know, the sort of has iconic things. I'm sorry for James Dean again. Here's Judy Garland. She's singing a song called I Don't Care, which is a pre-feminist song. It's like, I don't care, I don't care. I'm going to ask a guy on a date. I don't care, da, 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 da. You have to think like this is happening in the 50s and she's really changing things. Um, this is Elvis in Amsterdam from my own photo when we went to Amsterdam. Near the Anne Frank house there was a poster of Elvis that I took a picture of. But I, again, like the autonomy and the weird things that were happening in the reflections. Shirley Temple, who was a Republican but was one of the first stars to have a mastectomy and come out as having breast cancer. And in that recession of the, the Great Depression, she was like the biggest Hollywood star of all time. People looked at her for hope. Um, next to a whale. I felt no matter your, what your political persuasion, like Republicans like whales, right? <laughs> like everybody wants to save tigers. And if, they, if you get people on that, then maybe you could start thinking about the planet. Um, this was an oil tanker that came up against a giant wave that survived. Um, a panda. You know, there's obviously the cute factor to draw you in, but if you really start thinking about the world of pandas, this is the Karmapa. After the Dalai Lama dies, he's going to be the leading inheritor of Tibetan Buddhism, and he had to escape out of China. Um, Tibetan, you know, ruled China in like a back, uh, a trunk of a car, so he had a scar on him uh, next to a tiger next to uh, appropriation from a Courier Ives print of a clipper ship. Um, that was the fastest ship at its time, went through a horrible storm, but survived. So I, you know, I was feeling hopeful and I thought this was a good allegory. This is part two of good leaders, endangered species, ships at sea, because I felt like we needed good leaders because they were like an endangered species in a world that was a ship at sea. Um, and you know, with my shows, I really hope that they work like a giant comic where on all different sides of how you're seeing it, it's kind of like those cootie catchers like that. And like, hopefully you can see the juxtapositions and the narratives. Um, this is before uh, Obama won and it actually was up during the election. But you would think that the art world would be sort of super lifty liberal, but they aren't. We put this on the poster and Derek sent it out. And some people emailed him back and said, take me off your mailing list forever. I can't believe you're supporting this guy. Isn't that weird? Um, but you guys probably know that slaves built the Capitol building, so I thought that was so empowering to see Obama in front of it. You know, I'm micromanaging more and more, inspired by the old masters, because I realized that micromanaged moments of the old masters, like Cezanne, things start falling apart. And, and I, I can't let go of a painting enough, you know, and I want to keep filling it in and get over that souffle moment and like, push further and further. Um, this is a snow leopard uh, from one of the nature documentaries, but I was really excited about how it really got into sort of a strange abstraction that reminded me of those early iconscapes. That was next to a picture of the Dalai Lama at Radio City Music Hall. I saw him there for three days, and you think he's really cute and everything, and he has that Yoda voice, but then very quickly you realize how wise he is, and people stop taking notes because you can't keep up. But by the third day, only half the people were there, and it really felt like a weird floating spaceship. And if you believe, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, he is the reincarnation of this guy who's the Karmapa, the Shinrazig Buddha that's on this Tonka painting. And the weird thing to me is that the whole scene started representing it like a giant mandala. And these, even the screens, kind of look like the, the Buddhist entities that are floating, uh, you know, uh, on either side of Shinrazig. The guy in the suit with the white hair, by the way, was, um, uh, what's his name, the, the Richard Gere. Um, in in the sort of the project space, I, I put this 9-11 series because I felt like I wasn't crucified the last time. Hopefully this would be okay. 
And uh, these came from those old photos of the, the people hanging out the windows who were worried, you know, of what was going to happen. And it was a triptych. This was in the center. And I'd never seen this image before. I found it in a book. But they kept it away from New Yorkers because they thought it was so horrifying that New Yorkers would freak out. But I was painting it, you know, and doing my research on it. And it really felt like it was sort of, I really wanted to go and break into sort of a heavenly space and, and feel like this guy was being transported somewhere. And, you know, a lot of people didn't like the World Trade Center when it first was erected because they felt it was too modernist in, that, in its cold, steely, non-personable way. You know, it took the guy doing the tightrope walk between them to humanize it a little bit. And if you think of, you know, 9-11, what happened and the politics of it, it's, it's, it is, you know, like the economy, you know, uh, Walter Benjamin said, like, if capitalism keeps going, the economy and progress is going to happen so fast, and technology is going to develop, and a lot of people are going to, some few people are going to make a lot of money that won't get distributed to the masses. And if you think of a global economy, of course, I'm not a terrorist, I'm an American, I'm a patriot, but like, maybe that's part of the problems that, that happened, so. Anyway, I was doing, I'm, I'm not, I haven't given myself over to Buddhism yet, uh, but I was doing a little Buddhist prayer when I painted each of these people and said, you know, if, if I could take on the pain that you're suffering and give you happiness, you know, please let me give you happiness. And these are the hardest paintings I ever had to do, frankly. But people came into this room and they actually started crying and stuff, which I, w I wasn't, you know, I don't, I'm not proud of it or anything, but I'm just glad it was effective in the way that I wanted. Um, and then you came out of that room and you saw, you know, this is from those, those uh, Richard Attenborough nature documentaries about this utopic space where all the whales go for a mysterious reason to get all the, the shrimp or whatever and all the birds and sort of this utopia that I called Bally High from the South Pacific song next to Alexander the Great, who was, you know, a gay person, not that there were gay people in the time, but had same-sex relations, but I grew up with this book that was sort of this fly, you know, this was a, uh, you know, a dofold book, Overleaf, and this was one of the first books that showed that gay people could be powerful and, and, and good people. I mean, Alexander was a conqueror of other countries, but he did try to respect those countries at least before he was done in. I used to take my NYU students to Louise Bourgeois Salon, which was just over here on 19th Street. And uh, it was a, sort of the baptism into the art world. I felt like if you were living in France at the time, it would be like seeing Giacometti with plaster in his hair. Um, and if she liked your work, it would just like send you, you know. And I asked her to do, if I could do this photo, and she said, very good, and allowed me to do it. And I realized, like, you know, this felt like the hands on those rocks, or their whole cosmology was sort of behind it. This was next to the Marx Brothers from Duck Soup. This is that scene where they're saying, we're going to war, we're going to war. I don't know if you know this movie, but it's a great anti-war film, even though they denied it was. Uh, but the fascists won't let it be shown in Europe. Um, but it uses comedy to get its point across. Next to Anne Frank, you know, who was writing at the same time. And Anne Frank, you know, was amazing, obviously, and it was performative. She would write in her diary, I want to make the, I want to tell people about our plight. I want to be a great writer. I don't want to be like my mom. I don't want to be domestic. I want to be an empowered woman. And the funny thing is that she actually was all that while she was writing it. Um, and of course, made us understand what happened. But I also think for the boomer generation reading Anne Frank, way before Judy Bloom, in a much more real way, it showed that you could be a strong, independent, intellectual spirit and writer and creator and make change. Uh, and then this was from my ode to art history, the Duccio that we have at the Met, which all falls into other, all kinds of weird micromanaged worlds. I wasn't able to conquer it. This is the opening of the fifth seal of you know, El Greco. And of course, a lot of modernists would paint the folds and stuff. And you know, Jackson Pollock, and I don't know if you guys know Demoiselle d'Avignon by Picasso was inspired by these sort of wax figurines that El Greco painted. But weird stuff happens in the negative space that you're not looking at this painting. It was really weird. I listened to a whole Bible, both the Old and New Testament, on audiobook when I painted this. And gave me nightmares, but this was originally a painting done for a hospital to give people hope because this is that scene where people who died uh, for God arise again. Um, and okay, so I did a drawing show in Amsterdam that kind of got me drawing again. This is Andrew at, uh, at a hotel there, and we love that place, um, that was able to uh, enable me in some ways to get this drawing show at Paul Kasman, which was sort of a survey. I realize I'm going on, so I'm going to go through this fast. But just FYI, like my grad school teachers did not like that drawing show I showed you a little ways back, and I got like weird criticism from it that made me go home and cry and stuff. 
But I think we need to respect our teachers and listen to everything that they say and take for what you want from it and so on. But realize that if you love it, hopefully other people love it too. And years later, these same drawings that they weren't so sure about were at Kazman and were the first to sell. And I was like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I still respect my teachers. It's good to listen to your teachers. Um, this is of, uh, you know, David from the, these were some of the paintings I painted when I first came into New York to give me hope some of the abstract drawings I was doing. And it was really fun, this is one of the four horsemen, to show all these things together. So I could you know, show a little bit of New York, my progress. Uh, this is from the model drawings, another Anne Frank. This is Lincoln and Obama, because you know, he loves Lincoln so much. I, I hope that he stays our president for his, his full tenure and is actually able to get a lot of things done when the Republicans might be voted out next. Um, this was the Neo Integrity Comics edition. I was a trustee at the Museum of Comics and Cartoon Art when it was still about. And loving comics and the history of the comics and also knowing and loving fine art that participates in the iconic tradition, I wanted to mix it up. This is mostly 90% cartoonists and animators, but also fine artists. There's Dana and her husband Ryan Johnson with a clock there. This is Dan McCarthy on the bottom and some other fine art people and just mixing it all up and creating this installation that was like a giant comic that really covered the whole history of comics from Hogarth and I had Hogarth prints all the way to young people um, who are working now who were my students who are now getting published we had an underground comics area that was for 18 years and, and older, like the old comic book stores used to have, and animation and so on. So a lot of different kind of people saw this show, which really gave me, you know, heart. Um, simultaneously, I also got to bring my work out uh, when NYU invited me to do Broadway Windows. And this was a neat experience. I think the art world could care less. But this time Obama was in place, and I call it just good leaders. Um, endangered species just because I felt we still needed more good leaders and hopefully we weren't a ship at sea anymore. But it was really neat to bring your work out to the street, you know, as a painter too. It's like a hard thing to do. And when the UPS guy was talking about the Rosa Parks painting and stuff, it really was great. You know, it just made, it was one of my favorite shows I ever did. Um, okay. I, I, again, like all my shows hopefully are like comic narratives and it was, it, I really think about a show before I install it. I like, instead of counting sheep at night, I really think this will go here, this will go here, this will go here, this will go here, this is what I'll see through this doorway and so on to try and make these juxtapositions. I'm almost done. Uh, this is called My Modern Life and these are all from my own photos so this is a big step for me. Um, this is the Karmapa in New York when he was finally able to feel safe to come here and again, Weirdly, the Tonka painting seemed to reflect what was really happening. Um, this is from the play Red with Alfred Molina as Rothko. And the irony was that when the place, when you walked in, he was Rothko contemplating his painting, smoking a cigarette. And people kind of glanced at him and then willfully like ignored him and started perusing their playbills. But I love Manet. You know, Manet was able to have his cake and eat it too because he chose subject matter that was important to him that was political, sometimes subtly, but it brought a painterly verve to it. And so I felt this is sort of my Manet version of this play about modernity spilling into post-modernity. You know, Rothko comes back from a Warhol opening. He's like, who's this Warhol? What's up with these Coke bottles and stuff? And his assistant says, like, look, you're old. It's tired. Like, nobody cares about these big paintings and wanting to listen to tragic opera anymore. Like, Warhol's making work for the people. Um, but again, I think you could do both. Uh, this is me as, uh, for my senior uh, portrait for my yearbook that I never used, but I was secretly a deadhead, but I put on a Madras sport coat to look like a preppy GQ model, but I listened to the dead and stuff when I played this, and it brought me back, and I love, you know, what was going on with the, the rocks. This is Andrew, and in our, for our 40th anniversary, we had a blowout. Um, we had the, I had a show in Brussels, and we stayed at the Ritz in Paris. I'm still paying for it now, seven years later, but we were so happy. And I realized like the, the tapestry sort of blissed out into otherworldliness. I love the Empire State Building. I love the movie of Empire by Warhol, but I, I also feel it, it stands for like America's and New York's proudness. And you know, I love you know, that kind of architecture and how it's still alive, although it's sort of decaying. This is the New York Hotel off 34th Street. It looks to me like a King Kong-like mountain. This was the view from um, looking up from 38th Street and 9th Avenue 
in sort of our city of light. I was reading the T.J. Clark book about the Impressionists. This is sort of a Marxist take on the Impressionists. And you know, the Impressionists didn't choose obvious places in Paris. They chose the places that had yet to be gentrified. And I wanted to choose a place in New York that really felt New York-y to me without being a tourist. And I listened to all of Dante's Divine Comedy while I painted this, so because I feel like we could go into the nine circles of hell, but we could also go, you know, with the, the Seraphim Angels. And this is me. We stayed in the Proust room, and I really felt like listened to remembrance of things past while I was painting it. It was like he was whispering in my ear, and so much of my work is like that famous Madeline, you know, where he eats the Madeline, and that's the talisman sends him back to another time. Uh, this is us getting married. We got married the first Sunday we could in California before the window came down because we knew that it, it might happen. And this is our friend marrying us. And we pledged to love each other through eternity. And so I wanted the ceiling to sort of bliss out in an eternity. And it was really fun to paint this little quote from the Mary Boone painting. It really made me want to do figure to paint again. This is our little shack in California that I make look much better than it actually is probably. But again, like I want this to be like my Givigny. I think it's, you know, it's so beautiful and I love being there and to pull out of it what I can, but also allow myself to sort of spill into unconscious realms as a painting. Um, this ended that show, um, North America, um, you know, without the divisions and how we're one big land. But I had this dream to paint um, America as if it were a puzzle. And I realized that Jasper Johns paint, painted the flag from a dream. And it's always good to follow your dreams literally. And like, if you have a dream of making kind of artwork, that's the best thing to make. And so go out and make it right away. I found that Google Earth had the best images of America uh, that also hopefully go, went into abstraction. Luckily, Nodler, before they closed, one of their last shows in their project room was of these iconscapes. And this, for me, was really um, wonderful. And, and I, I felt vindicated that this fancy gallery that was um, the oldest gallery in America started you know, by the same gallery that Theo Van Gogh, Vincent's brother, um, worked in, would give me a show of these things. And, and, uh, you know, so sometimes if people don't get it right away, just keep at it. Don't give up. You know, hopefully, you know, good things will happen. Um, this is the plein air of painting from that. Um, almost done. Sorry, I promise. Art and fashion, art, life, and fashion in Cleveland again. I kept going with these fashion images and pictures of the fashion images that we that I took. I took over 3,000 pictures. This is Andrew looking at Obama during the debates when we were in France. Him smelling roses at the Ritz. Uh, this is a bookstore in Amsterdam, the American bookstore that had all my favorite titles in the front of it. This was an Anne Frank Sweet series. I later turned into animation, of Floating Gardens from Amsterdam. Uh, this is the Empire State Building from the train. I felt it was like a giant robot or something. I love Times Square and I wanted to try to do obvious images but make them fresh or new or something and I felt like you know, without all the signage, it's like a really strange place. But when you start looking at the signage and what it's telling you to do in terms of all the, the capitalist kind of, I'm, a, I'm kind of a capitalist, but like the egregious, horrible things about capitalism, it's all like beaming in your face, like do, produce, buy, consume. I don't know if you've seen that movie, They Live, where they put on the sunglasses and they realize the aliens have taken over the earth and all the billboards are saying consume, buy. This is a little bit about that. You know, City Mouse, Country Mouse, here we are back in sort of blissful land with our puppies. And this is, gives you an idea of what we look at. These are like trailer homes with retirees and crystal meth labs, but then nature overwhelms all. And you know, I've, I've, I've uh, you know, gotten a taste for Turner and what that can mean. And uh, this is the night cabin. Um, you know, I'm hoping these are a little William Eggleston, you know, like they, they show like the content of the blight. This was sort of the center of the recession in California, um, but hopefully something more. I got to curate a show called Eight Americans in Brussels um, that was a little bit like Neo Integrity, but very economized. The dealer wanted more of the fancy names and he suggested a couple, which hopefully makes sense. It's, you know, a gallery shows work that's like yours, hopefully. And this is Wade Guyton and Jacob Cassay and Craven. Uh, and uh, another Jacob, uh, my painting, and, and this is um, Francis, Francis Di Matteo. 
Uh, Hilary Berseth, uh, those are Wade's drawings there and Jacob's drawings and a Joe Bradley. The main thing about this show that was important is he allowed me, this is a picture I did from him, he allowed me to do, videotape the artists and interview them. I don't know if you've ever seen the documentary Painter's Painting, but it's a really great straight on documentary with Rauschenberg just telling it like it is and starts out with Barnett Newman and ends with Warhol. So you really see modernism in the postmodernity. I wanted to make an easy speak video online before there, you know, this is just a couple of years ago, but now there are a lot more artist videos online where I'm interviewing people about where they're coming from and easy speak as one artist to another. And so if you go to my website, which is my full name.com, hopefully they're still online. You could scroll down and find it. But that was the, the whole meaning for the show for me is getting to interview these guys and getting content for everybody. This is Andrew sleeping, um, called The Sleeper at the Cabin. I really like how the reflections are blissed out and became sort of a, a you know, like a, the Pinocchio splotch drawings are there and cats in Goya, you know, next to a clown nose and the American flag. And so for me, it sort of tells the story. Uh, this is called uh, My American Dream, and I was invited by Derek to do the Nada Art Fair. And I wanted to do sort of a gay Guernica, but in a good way, to make a statement again in a, in a cash and carry scenario, and they want salon style. Um, and so I came up with this of all these images, mostly from my own life, our cabin again. Uh, this is me when we were on 46th Street holding our Yorkie next to these city pings I didn't get a chance to show you. Um, next to Rockefeller Center, which is, you know, like broadcasting news and information and content out to the world and it's kind of foreboding and Rockefeller and it's now the GE building. Um, this is my, my German shepherd Julian who died and I painted this painting to remember him. That same Rembrandt movie is painting Saskia right after he dies, after she dies and they come to Rembrandt and they're like, Rembrandt, why aren't you at Saskia's funeral? You gotta go there. He's like, go away. I wanna paint Saskia while I still remember her. And so I painted my shepherd while I still remembered him. And, this is kind of a tropey thing to say, but sometimes I kind of think like if a subject matter is important to you, especially as a painter, if you just paint it to get it out, sometimes those are your best pa paintings. Like people really, people come to my studio, they all, I don't want to sell this painting or anything, but this is the painting they always gravitate to. I'm like, well, what about these political ones or this one or this one? They're like, no, I like the dog. <laughs> I'm like, but it's not a, it's just my dog. And they're like, yeah, but I like how it's painted. You know, so. I still think it needs to be a, okay, so this is uh, Andrew on a raft with our two puppies. That's Michelangelo, our little silver puppy got out after we mourned the death of Julian. And for me, it was really important to have my wedding ring in there because it's about gay marriage and Rosa, my apricot poodle, and here's Michelangelo and the world that we exist in. Um, here's us on the way to the Van Gogh Museum and the Rijks Museum, two of my favorite places on earth with my favorite artists. I mean, it was really neat to see the Rembrandt Caravaggio show at the Van Gogh Museum at that time and realize that these old masters were doing stuff that still seems pertinent to today and brought out the, you know, all the old masters are doing stuff by commission, but they're able to exceed the commission. They aren't just making rich people happy. They're putting something extra into it, you know, and it, sometimes it's allegorical. And if you look at micromanaged moments, they really spill into unconscious sub sublime spaces. 34th Street, looking up at Empire State Building, the two men on the moon, this is Neil Armstrong, um, right before he died actually, and sometimes we feel when we're out in California like we're the two gay guys in a world that doesn't understand us. Um, I still do appropriation, this was for that Gavin Brown show, Joe Bradley asked me to do this peanuts paying over. Originally, she, our friend uh, who was a woman who died of AIDS, she, did, she had a bad lover and she didn't know she had it. And then she was sick in the hospital and a week later she was gone. But she was a big Snoopy fan. I'm a big Snoopy fan. And she gave me this coloring book right before she passed on. And so I did it in honor for her. And Andrew owns that one. But uh, I did a new one thinking, of course, about her and listening to Elton John and ABBA and the people that she liked, but also listening about Charles Schultz, who really had a huge impact on culture, and James Dean again. This is my last show. And, and probably, thankfully for you, the, towards the end of my lecture here, um, this was, happened last spring. Um, this was sort of the Uber version of My American Dream. More supply than demand again. And I was going back into Iconscapes after doing that Nodler show to see what would happen. And I thought, should I do the figurative painting show? It's safe. But I looked around my studio, I'm like, you know, these abstract paintings are really what's happening right now, along with these figurative works. I'm just going to do it. Um, so oh, luckily, people liked it, I guess. Um, I always wanted to paint Obama's family, and so when he was inaugurated again, 
Um, I got the perfect opportunity to take that image from the front of the New York Times of he and his family. But I also felt like sort of Goya-esque with the, you know, he's so divisive and people don't all like him, of course. And so like I wonder what's happening in that crowd and thinking my thoughts about it. Next to, you know, this is a new iconscape that I really hadn't done before, but I realized that, you know, in Love Cezanne, you see his face. They, I always think of these Cezanne holes that happen in Cezanne, where you really, if you look carefully, you see like eyes and a mustache and the teeth that Cezanne probably had, or Van Gogh's cypress trees. You start seeing, you know, his unconscious, like, iconic persona in the cypress trees, like portraits that look like Van Gogh in those trees. And I realized, like, this looked like my eye and a nose and a mustache and a beard and, like, the profile on my head. But again, I'm trying not to think too much, but I juxtapose it to hopefully non-cheesy pictures of maybe obvious things. But um, last Labor Day weekend a year ago, we took this cheap boat trip from Chelsea and saw the Statue of Liberty and really thought about, I was trying to think about what liberty really means and what the immigrants really thought and what I think about America now and felt a little prescient to Sandy, you know, because like there was that sort of viral image of like this, that was photoshopped of like a, a cloud around it. Another iconscape. Uh, this is sort of the view from Rockefeller Center. I, I paint so much of Rockefeller Center, I want to paint the view going on from it and feeling good about myself and, 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 and the world and hoping that it broke down as sort of little Broadway boogie boogie moments. Um, next to, this was in the project room. It was sort of the James Dean room. We did a pilgrimage there to Fairmont, Indiana, where he grew up. And it felt like there was, there was those God fingers coming out of the sky you know, in this sort of privileged space of, place of a pop culture, like kind of Jesus next to this. And I, I really want, like, you know, if I had this next to this, that people could see, like, the figures and forms that I see in the clouds or on the ground. And vicariously, people could start seeing the forms in the abstract paintings. Um, this is James Dean's house that was, that's still owned by his little cousin, was basically his uh, little brother, Marcus Winslow, because he was raised by his aunt and his uncle. And he lived in this room, and I felt like the tree was almost pointing in that room, and I started feeling like ghost-like, you know, like there were ghosts in it. This was, next to the house was his mother's grave, and he used to go out to talk to his mom at the grave and would see her spirit there. And uh, when I was there, I honestly, this kind of looked like James Dean's face. I don't know if you know that James Dean loved the, the Little Prince, but this started looking like the fox from the Little Prince. And, and um, the statue over here kind of looks like the Little Prince. And of course, this is Dream. Um, next to these are you know, some of the first iconscapes that I did. This is the, the, the view from empire. And I wanted that to work as a metaphor, like the, you know, our empire, what that means in terms of the power of America, the power of New York. Um, and to sort of paint it to create that sort of sublime feeling, which is about, the, I think, the secret of the sublime is micromanaging everything to the macromanaged whole. So you see it anew. You know, like when you're a little kid, without that language, you're looking at everything, it seems like it's alive, and you fall into this sort of ecstatic bliss. If you could, you know, touch things enough to make them alive again for the whole, then maybe you could get that sublime feeling happening again. And I felt like we were, really, we were like sort of a ship at sea. Um, this is sort of a detail of that. It was really fun to just to paint this forever. Um, this is a view of our Chelsea window at the 4th of July. The fireworks had moved down, and so we were in bed with our puppies, and the fireworks are going on, these booms are happening, and it was kind of exciting, but kind of scary, kind of like a science fiction movie. And I, you know, I worry about New York and America and, and us at war. Um, this was a large iconscape that doesn't show up very well on screen. Um, but I, I really want, you know, to il not illustrate the unconscious like Salvador Dali, but bring it about in more of a Renaissance-like space than you would see in a Gorky. There's another detail from it. Next to this, this eagle got me through Sandy. A lot of my stuff was in the basement of Derek's. Donna well knows this because she helped me, she helped pull out all these paintings and pour water over them that the restorer said that we were supposed to do. It was a nightmare. I really owe you, like, my life. I mean, we had a lot of... Donna was walking down the street, and she was so generous and nice, and just spent a whole day with me going to the soggy, wet basement, pulling out this stuff. I was painting this the night before by, you know, candlelight, and then the next day I didn't know what had happened. I went there, and he opened up the basement door, and it was filled to the, to the top of the water. It was like a swimming pool. Um, but this painting got me through all that, and it was from a, a, a plaster statue on the top of an American's Eagle's Lodge in Huntington, California, next to Andrew's fam favorite Chinese restaurant. Um, and then here's us. 
I love the painting of Rembrandt, the Jewish bride, you know, and so, uh, you know, this is my emulation of trying to get to that feeling where we love it, and, you know, it's the morning. And this is the last slide in the show. This is my family. Um, I always want to do a family picture, but being a son of a psychoanalyst, you have to be very careful. I don't know if your parents ever look at your art and see themselves in it, but my parents could be very, like, and I felt like I had to go get to a good place and really edipalize with my parents. And so I feel good about them to paint them and my sister. And, uh, you know, my cousin took this photo. She remembered it when she saw it. And it was when we first got our first big TV. We had a little tiny TV. And my great-grandmother was like, loved television. was like, you can't have this TV. And she gave us kind of a big one that my, uh, my sister had this dollhouse that she didn't use. My dad turned it over, put carpet on it. And so we're watching our first color TV sort of enthralled, so I was listening to West Side Story and Hair and Jesus Christ Superstar. My whole parents' record collection realized all my ideology comes from that and hoping that it sort of blisses out into abstraction and comes together in figurative ways. It's kind of blissed out here in this photo, but I noticed this putting, assembling this lecture last night that what goes around comes around because my first painting in grad school um, weirdly looks a little bit, it doesn't, weirdly looks a little bit like me chewing my, my fingernail. Well, I have to say, like, I feel like painters who still, I love all kinds of art. I really and truly do. I have no hierarchy. But I have a feel, I have a feeling that if you're painting with a brush, it's a little bit like being one of the last of the Jedi Knights, you know, if you're, especially oil painting with a brush. I find we, we oil painters with brushes congregate in corners at openings and stuff and talk shop and about mediums and stuff like that. And there is something like when you're perceiving something consciously, but the flicker of your wrist is recording both your con conscious and unconscious moves that's incredibly pleasurable. It's like brain yoga. You know, I'm sure like all kinds of art making is satisfying, but there's really something about going like this that I just love. And I, I found that I, I kind of was drawn into it, probably for the passion and love of the medium, what it felt like in my brain when I was doing it. And so with that, I, I feel that a lot of my ideas are generated as painting ideas, you know, and like, I don't think, oh, could this be a video? I think a lot of artists, you know, a lot of people say, I'm not a painter, I'm an artist who happens to sometimes paint, but also will do photos and stuff. I respect that, but I'm not the person that kind of has those ideas necessarily, although I, I want to do more graphic novels and things like that. Um, and so I find a lot of my ideas come from wanting to paint them. And I have a lot of ideas, but it's kind of, I feel like a barber. You know, maybe you guys are like this, you have a lot of ideas, but there's one that nudges you the most, and they're the ones in the first chair that you probably should do first. I believe, I believe in, like, something that I told some of the students today is do what you want to do, not what you feel you should do. Because if you feel that you're doing something you should do, you're thinking about what other people think. If you do something that you want to do, you're doing something that you instinctively want to do. It's about your desire, and sometimes that work that comes out of that is the best. And it's probably emblematic of something that's happening in your life. As a painter, too, as you put all those pieces together, sometimes if you're thinking of the meditation of your issues, you put those problems together in your mind, too. And that's also very satisfying. Um, I think Richter is super important for anybody's painting from photos. I mean, I think we're all reacting in some ways towards him. But they always say that Richter is about not penetrating the surface of the photo, but painting the surface of it. And a lot of people have a very cool response towards Richter. But when you see a Richter up close and personal, it is about that surface, but still made out of oil paint. You feel this some untangible, ineffable warmth to it. And certainly, I don't know if you guys saw that movie, Ger Richter Painting, where he's going with a giant squeegee. I used to think that was just conceptual abstraction, where he would like blot out colors and go, boom, and he was done. But you realize watching that movie, it's just a giant palette knife. And he's painting just like the old guys did. At the end of the day with painters, especially people coming from the 80s and stuff, and Neo Geo, whatever that was, reading Baudrillard and simulations, if they're still alive, they're painting for the love of painting, and they're still trying to achieve the sublime too, being a small part of a bigger thing. They're doing it with a little bit more conscious intelligence maybe put into the work, you know, than Rothko, who thought his coloristic machines transport people in other worlds, which they do, but it's ideological, and you have to learn how to look at a Rothko to do that. But at the end of the day, when you're, when you're going like this, going with color and form and emotion, to me it's about transcendence. And sometimes the subject matter is just the thing that jettisons off that transcendence. And I choose my subject matter because I just want to paint them because they're bugging me in a good way.
Well, I, I have to tell you, like I, I did publish a graphic novel with a collaboration with Dennis Cooper that was republished a couple years ago by Harper Perennial. But I kind of keep my comic yayas going on in class with my students in terms of drawing panels and stuff. I want to do a James Dean graphic novel that I started that I never, and I still think about it all the time. But I find myself more drawn to the feeling of a brush on canvas, and when I start, I love nibs and ink and paper, but sometimes I start and I'm like, you know what, F it, I just want to paint. And so I, but I still think of these things as narratives. I really do think of them as car comics. I don't know if my colleagues down the, the street agree with me, but I do think of them as narratives. And I really do think of them as like a, a three-dimensional comic that you're stepping in the world of that hopefully is experiential. People understand Raymond Pettibone as being kind of like comics, and he could juxtapose salon style all of his drawings. But sometimes when you see paintings on the wall, people still think of them individually. It's really hard for people to get paintings as a group, as an installation that actually says something. Like, I love Craig Owens towards the theory of postmodernism, um, which talks about how everything is allegorical. And he talks about Rauschenberg's Rebus. That's the painting they have at MOBA that has the comic in it. And it's about reading a painting and talking about installations of paintings in museums to transcribe ideas of art history. And from there, I was like, you know, it's all installation. It's all storytelling. No matter what you're doing, even if you aren't consciously thinking about it, you're telling a story, why not fully utilize that? But hopefully people are getting it or will, will continue to get that. I find students now are more and more involved, fine art students, in the idea of installs as being stories. You know, I want, like I'm working for a show in Houston now called Cowboys and Indians because, it, well, it's perfect for Houston and I'm from Colorado, so. Um, but I want like good cowboys and good Indians. And I, I had this picture of Annie Oakley with me for a long time that I did a drawing of that I always wanted to paint. But it started churling in my mind even before the offer to kind of do this and like want to get back to it. And I still think all the time, like I know Sitting Bull's next because Sitting Bull was also in the Wild West show and he adopted Annie Oakley as a daughter and he was such a powerful figure and stuff like that. But like in terms of the other ones I'm going to do, I'm like collating images all the time and really thinking about them and like watching movies and like, so it's always on my back burner. And, I, and, and before the show, it was sort of an idea that I had a general idea of, but as I'm embarking upon it, I don't know all the images that are gonna be in it yet, but I'm not, whenever I have off time on the subway or whatever, it's always in my mind, it should be this, should be this, should be this, what does this mean with this, et cetera. As I'm, as I'm devising it, I know the composition of the room. I'm like, I paint this because it will go well here. And I know that I, like, I want Louise Bourgeois and Anne, Flank, Anne Frank, you know, bracketing the Marx Brothers, and as weird as that seems, like I, I, I did advise that as a triptych almost. I, I kind of knew it. I did, it's not like I have the paintings and then at the day of the install, I'm like, okay, how's it all gonna go? I find with installations, it's best to know exactly how it's gonna go before you go in there. Because people are gonna be, you know, coming in and out, and the dealer or whatever, there's a lot of weird energy that happens. And like, if you go in with a mindset and politically talk to whoever it is that's in charge of that space and let them know that you have your ideas in place and let that be okay, then they like it. Sometimes it's hard for them to relinquish control, but it's really good because then you go like this, and it always, it's almost, I, I, I sometimes draw it, it's almost exactly like how I drew it. No, not really, you know, I, it is funny because like when we were at Brown and stuff, I thought, oh, gay people are okay and everybody knows this, da, 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 da. but like in the outside world, it wasn't like that. And there were a lot of gay dealers and artists who were frankly in the closet because they, they thought it would ruin their business, which is weird when you're thinking 1988, you think that's sort of an accelerated culture. Due to the AIDS crisis and, you know, people really congregating and, like, silence is, is, is deadly, you know, that kind of philosophy, a lot of people did come out at that time. Uh, you know, paintings with penises won't sell, usually, you know. Uh, <laughs> Jason Fox did this great painting of this guy on a chain link fence like this. He was sort of like this caveman, like altered states. And then he didn't paint the genitalia. And I was like, that's kind of a cool maneuver. Like, why'd you do that? He's like, well, paintings, paintings with penises don't sell. Which is kind of true. You know, a lot of the art world who's buying it, even the gay people are buying stuff. They don't, like, they don't want that, that they think it should be in the, in the bathroom. Um, I like to think that the art world's warming up to it. And, and uh, certainly there are a lot of, you know, lesbian and gay and 
otherwise queer, transgender folk participating. It's, there is a little, I would, I would say there's a little bit of a niche of that. You know, I just came to the Met, from the Met today, and you see the sort of the patriarchal discourse that's happening up the grand staircase. I think if you look in Chelsea, luckily, glacially, things are different now. There are way more women participating in the art world than ever before. Way more people of color, at least on the wall or in the galleries. It's hard to you know, think of people of color who are running the galleries, which is weird. Uh, but in terms of gay things, it's, I think it's OK. I'm not complaining. And I think even early on, it was fine. People liked Pinocchio. They thought it was funny. Uh, but also, it might have been a reaction to the somewhat more, I like to think that that was serious in constant humor as a seductive agent to help the medicine go down. But it, might, it was after the 93 biennial, which people really reacted against. But I think that was my, might have been more the didacticism of that time where, and even Larry Pittman, who was one of my teachers, said this. He was in that biennial. He said he liked art that, tells, that invites you to think for yourself rather than telling you what to think. You know, retrospectively, I'm not sure how much of that art really told you what to think or was saying blank power right on. But at the same time, I understand the politics of that. Um, I do think it's important to wave my freak flag high. You know, in every show I have, there's something pretty gay in it. Um, and I think it's important to put that in there and not shy away. Uh, but I think, you know, the more demure you are, the more accessible it is. But that doesn't mean that it's not, it can't be like content rich too. But I, I do think of art as being political. I mean, I, I, I think of this as, for me, it's about the content of the discourse of being able to portray things that make people think about the world, hopefully, if it's good enough, when they leave the gallery a little bit. And I think that's, you know, I'm a message person. I just, I, even if it's open and ambiguous and poetic, like I, I can't divorce myself from the politics in which I engage with and the art world and teaching and everything. That's why I love to teach, too. I think it's political. I have a funny palette. I, I have a full range. I'm kind of an RPG person. Um, and my palette has all the primaries. I have a lot of primaries. I have a lot of yellows, a lot of reds, a lot of blues. I have my violets. But I don't own a tube of black paint. I don't own a tube of green paint or brown paint. And I mix all my colors from that. I just, early on, I don't know if it was Wendy Edwards or something, like said you can make all colors from the primary colors, you know? And so I just feel that, that and when we're working from so much printed media, you know, a lot of the printed media too is working with RPG kind of colors and stuff. And so it's just my thing, but I, I arrange it chromatically on my palette and I, my palette starts looking like the mountain of Mars. After, you know, there are all these piles and mounds and stuff, but it is organized in some ways. And I use wall and oil, because it doesn't have anything terrible in it that will kill you and there's no fumes and I just allow my brush to go wherever it wants to go. Well, it's funny because I was talking to, to a student today about Laura Mulvey, you know, visual pleasure and narrative cinema. Even though it was written in the early 70s, I still think it's really true today. Uh, visual pleasure and narrative cinema by Laura Mulvey. It used to be a canonical text that we all read and was talking about like the world of characters who happen to be women in cinema, largely dominated by, um, oh, by men. Um, and it's really interesting. I mean, I think the world has gotten better now. But for instance, you know, a lot of my, this is weird, but a lot of the differences between my fine art students and my cartoonists happens to be class and race, which is kind of weird. When you think about it, you think high and low is over, but it's not. It's, you know, taste is habit, Duchamp said, and some of my kids down the street didn't have access to galleries and museums, and they were drawn more to comics. Some of them are just wired to tell stories through word image combinations. But the neat thing is, 16 years ago, most of my classes were all men from Long Island doing superhero stories, nothing wrong with that. And there'd be one long-haired guy doing weird stuff with piano keys and napkins, which was cool, and there'd be one trooper in the mix, right? Um, but now, over half our classes are women which is amazing, and it's like a, a rainbow coalition of all different kinds of people, all different kinds of storytelling, largely due to female creators working in manga, you know, Japanese comics that have influenced these people to want to do comics in the first place. But I say to them, like, how many female film directors can you name over the age of, how many female film directors can you name who aren't Sofia Coppola or Catherine Bigelow? And it's really hard for them to come up with names. Because they think this is all hippie stuff, you know? And they, but then they like, wait, I don't, I don't know. And then I'm like, well, 
how many African-American actors can you name have won Oscars? And we can name a few. And then I say, well, how many African-American, um, uh, how many Latino actors can you name have won Oscars? How many Latino name, actors can you name? How many uh, Asian actors, can you, how many Asian male actors can you name who aren't Jackie Chan's or Karate Chop people, even though I like Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee and all that? And there's very few. How many women, Asian women can you name who aren't like Lucy Liu dragon ladies, using that as an obvious stereotype, who aren't flanked by white girls like in Charlie's Angels, white women? And it's very hard for them. And so they kind of start to get it. I mean, I think the world is getting better in cinema, but in comics, it's hard for them to name women creators over the age of 30. It's my, when I curated that show about comics, I really wanted an African-American woman in it. And I asked all my colleagues at SBA, you know every cartoonist on the planet, and they could not name one. And I found one person named Barbara Brandencroft who had a daily cartoon strip that was canceled after just a couple of years. That's it. So it's weird to me. I don't know if that answers your question at all about the female gaze, um, but I, I'm noticing in the movies just recently, I saw the to-do list. Did anybody see that this summer? Really funny kind of coming of age story of a woman. Written, in, written by a woman and directed by a woman, but it was different. It was different. I don't want to gender stereotype people's points of view, because I think no matter what gender you are, you could be a sensitive person too. Like, straight white guys can make totally sensitive, wonderful work, and I love all of our history, and I love movies and all of that. But when you look around this room and you see everybody, it's neat to have all these, all these voices in the world being seen. And I can't categorize one thing over another, except I could talk about Laura Mulvey and the male gaze, but I don't know what the gay gaze is. <laughs> but I like to think that anybody who's an artist, you know, we're in a world of patriarchy, which I think is, is more about corporate commodity culture than it is about waving the finger at any one individual or group of individuals. And as artists, we're all in the margins looking on to see what's anew and critically looking at the culture, hopefully making work to make the world a better place a little bit by your voice. And so no matter what your gender orientation, ethnicity, or nationality, artists are all in the same flying saucer doing good stuff for the world in my book. You know, again, like I had that epiphany, I looked around my studio, I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't originate any of these images. Like I appropriated them and hopefully changed them and made them my own, but about, what about that autonomy? And when you look at art history, it's like a lot of guys paying their wives, you know, in a good way, and, and like their own experiences. And, and really looking at Manet for me was key because like Manet is able to position all of his people and his paintings in such a manner that's very subtle, but it's narrative. And you have, you know, the famous barmaid looking at you, looking at her, and so you're objectifying her, and she's working woman, literally, because like a lot of those people were sex workers as well as bartenders, and yet she's assessing the guy, checking her out, and, da, 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 da. and it has an incredible painterly verve, you know, and the reflections in the window, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy has cake and it too. He can, instead of looking at magazines and books and art history and texts, he could just like show the world in a different way. Um, and that was very influential to me. Dealers, you know, were nervous because they're like, well, uh, you know, like you're, you should do a Keanu painting, you know, like because like they feel a little bit more confident about that. Not that I sell that much or anything, but I'm like, you know, I just want to, I want to, you know, you know, you paint your dog and stuff, and you realize like the emotional satisfaction of doing that when you're really paying something that you're directly connected to and how illuminating that is and cathartic it is. It's hard to paint your family, you know, to paint your dad or your mom is t tough, you know, and I think of Whistler's mother and all that and those paintings or Monet painting his wife on her deathbed and stuff. It's really uh, emotional for me. Like sometimes you go to schools outside of New York City and people are painting their girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever and it seems cheesy, but you look at art history and it's not, so why should it be now? Um, you know, I think Making work that's reflective of who and where and what you are as a person is a really hard thing to do. When you're making work that's not literally a picture of you, but just you see yourself reflected in that work, your, your voice is in there. And a lot of artists aren't that articulate, and they're going, Bleh! and they make this thing that's sort of this walking, talking Frankenstein monster that walks and speaks for you. That's a hard thing to connect with. But I find, for me, it's the most fulfilling. I, like artists like Louise Bourgeois I love because like, she's doing sort of these abstract things that are avatars for her feelings. Like 
she did those insomnia drawings, but each circle supposedly represented one of her sons. So she'd be like, oh, Jean-Louis, he never calls me, but, <laughs> but Jean, he loves me, I love him so much, but that's Jean-Louis, I don't know, <laughs> you know? But, and you don't know, it's sort of the lost wax process that gets lost, but it's the impetus to make those images. And even when people are doing abstract painting, I think of, I tell them like, you know, think about the meditation of every gesture. Like maybe you're doing this, you know, I think it's good in the 21st century to be able to support the idea of why you're doing ideologically abstract painting. But there's a difference between decorative work that's like merely pleasurable and, you know, Mary Heilman or any of the great abstract painters are right now where I feel it's a motivated gesture that's based maybe off instinct but also based on maybe what they're thinking about, the meditation that en engenders that stroke. That, that you could tell when you look at it, it's not merely decorative, the, 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 that it was potent for the artist to do it. But I think that meditation, it's all about that meditation and like thinking about it and, and figuring out, maybe you don't know why you want to do something but the act of making is about figuring it out. And that's what hopefully gives life to the work ultimately. I love religious work, you know, because they're so imbued with the idea of like in Byzantine icon times of like channeling the spirit or the entity that they're, you know, they're talking to the Virgin Mary, they're painting them. And because of that, sometimes that work has a lot of power. And I don't think you need to be religious to be a good artist, but if you're doing something that's meaningful to you, doing what you want to do, obsessing about what you obsess about, sometimes it comes out better. But this could also be totally an intellectual thing. It could be a totally political thing. It doesn't need to be a, a picture of your wife or husband or child. You know, it could be an idea that you fervently believe in. That's always the best work. That is kind of a funny, that's a actually interesting, that's a timely question because I painted that, this, that last family painting for my dad's 80th birthday. I thought they would like it, but you know, parents are parents, they're like, well, we like this picture, but it's so big, like, we don't want a big painting of us at our house, it's weird. And they asked me to do a smaller version of it, but I feel like I'm probably not going to be able to go to that same emotional space while I do it. Just for me personally, I don't mind when people redo paintings at all, if you could bring something new to it. But I'm going to ask them to choose something else that they really like to do smaller for them. I probably wouldn't repaint it. Yeah, I probably, I've tried to redo things and it never turns out the same because I'm not in that same emotional space. I guess that's how it's different from method acting. I, you know, it's a different performance, but and it's not near, sometimes as good, it's not as potent. Okay, I, when I went to this old masters, the Rembrandt Caravaggio show at the Van Gogh Museum, I had this epiphany that, do you guys know what the Kantian sublime is? It's like when you feel a small part of a much bigger thing that you can't put a frame around. And like, I, th okay, yeah, sure. The Kantian, Immanuel Kant, the German oh, philosopher, okay. had pleasurable, which was merely good, satisfying a need, but not doing more than that. Something that was good, it satisfied a need in a, in, a, in a way that you feel morally attached to. Somewhat separately, in his critique of judgment, he talks about idea of beautiful, emulating nature, not about fulfilling a need or anything, but emulating like, you know, George Lucas's idea of art was like a cave person smells a rose in the field and then paints it on the wall for other people to smell it synesthetically too. But his idea of the sublime is when you, and he doesn't think, I don't think that art could actually do this, but I'm not sure if I agree, but when, you, when you're overwhelmed with this, feel, like have you ever seen a picture of the Grand Canyon? And you're like, oh yeah, the Grand Canyon. But when we actually go, have you gone to the Grand Canyon? And it's like, boom, this huge, cra create, you know, gorge in the middle of the ground and there's this sort of trickle of water happening way down there and you, you know how that happened and the Grand Canyon happened but it's happen it happened centuries before you and will hopefully exist centuries after you and it's so big and you're so small and your tongue starts getting big and you start choking on your tongue. Oh. You know, that's the sublime. You know, it could be a pleasurable thing, like if you're looking at the Grand Canyon, it could be a horrible thing if you witness 9-11, but it's when your world is out of control. There's the dynamically sublime, which I think, like, if you've ever gone to Sistine Chapel and you see, you know, Michelangelo's ceiling in The Last Judgment, and you're like, oh my gosh, this guy did that? He did all this? Like, which is like Charlton Heston in that movie? How do you do it? Like, freaks me out. Or the Pieta, you know, down the street of the Vatican, like, that sends me into something. Um, 
But I think the secret of that, like I still think that for me that's the golden ring, you know, can you achieve the sublime in art? Can you make people conscious of their consciousness and where they are in the world? Because if, they could, if you could make art that does that, hopefully they go back in the world and say, sort of a Buddhist thing, I'm a small part of a much bigger world. I, much, I should participate in making it better, you know, like save the flora and the fauna and like be kind to my neighbors and stuff like that. Um, when I went to that old master show, I realized I got some of those feelings a little bit from those paintings, and I realized the secret was micromanaging to the macromanage whole. If you look at Da Vinci painting, or look, at the Uffizi, I had this experience too of like the Annunciation, and you look in the garden behind, you know, the Madonna and the angel and stuff. Like he's figured out every little golden ratio for every leaf on every plant. And the, that relationship to the other plant, to the clouds, to the sky, he's activated, by, he's activated it by focusing on it and really getting into the nuances of like the fractals of that. When you're looking at um, Van Gogh, like in a more modernist space with expression, he's doing the same thing. All the cypress trees, like the, the golden ratio of you know, one thing going next to another thing for every leaf of the tree is activated by him coloristically like observing it and making it come alive in his imagination via his brush. And so I think like when you're looking at those paintings, what's happening is it reinvigorates that same sensation you had before you had the language to understand everything because everything seems alive formally. There's push and pull happening to the micromanaged elements to the macromanaged whole. So like when I, when I paint now, I grid it with as many little squares as I can when I'm looking at a photo and I fill in all the little squares to the nth degree, I go over and over and over again with a 03 brush until there's almost crevices happening on my canvas of the squares until I figured as much as I can out, then I peel over the layer of the vellum of the grid and paint through the grid over and over and over again until I just exhaust myself of that painting because I want to try to get the micromanage to the macromanage. I think that for me that's the secret of the sublime because like you get those, you know, schizophrenic supposedly can't differentiate one brick from another and it becomes too much noise. But in painting, if you're able to activate all these things and make them sort of vibrate and come alive in terms of the stimuli, hopefully it's not just merely a visceral kind of entertaining thing. Hopefully you really sort of are reawakened to those same feelings you had when you were a kid and everything seemed alive and you didn't understand everything and you were really present in observing the world around you as in its pure objecthood rather than it's signified rather than its signifier and become overwhelmed by it. I do sometimes do that. I do sometimes do that, but I don't feel that's bad. You know, because like if you did, if you were in theater, like say you have a Broadway play and you open it up in Greenwich or something just to test it out. Maybe you'll use some of those songs, like if it was a musical, maybe you would edit out some of those songs and you could bring it to a new venue and like revamp it. And so, when I had the Not Affair show, it was just three days. You know, I worked so long in all those paintings. And so I was like, you know, I still have plans for this. I want to extend it. Even the Cowboys and Indians, I want to extend the show I just did at Derek's to something you know, as like a sort of an uber project. So I don't have really have a problem reusing things. I feel like it's such a rarefied world. So few people see these paintings. And honestly, when you see a painting, even in a gallery, how long do you spend with that painting? Maybe three minutes, if you're lucky. And so if you have the opportunity to show it again, I just did all that work. I still have the painting. I might as well show it. I don't care if people know that I'm repeating myself because I feel like in a different context, it's going to give it new verve and amplify the uber content of what I want. Yeah. Anytime you juxtapose it differently, it's different. Like I, I had the James Dean house and I'm not a fair and kind of sat there and I, I liked how it was interacting with one another, but I was really happy to bring it into a new context and surround it with things that hopefully gave it greater verve. And so it is like sort of like, I think of it really like theater, you know, you could take something and change it, it's malleable and you move it to give it a new position to see how it works, like a character in a play or a scene. Any other questions? Thank you guys for being such a patient audience amongst those community. <laughs>